jump out at me. That is number one, the margin on this is more than 33%, more than a third. That's very good. The other thing is the EBITDA and the cash flow are the same. When that tells, number one, it's rare to see that. It's rare to see that in a business listing. Usually there's some adjustments to cash flow, some things added back. When they're the same like this, to me, the, this seems good. I like this. It seems like the books are really clean and the owner is not, you know, kind of stuffing any of his personal expenses into the business, you know, and considering it discretionary spending. Let's read the description here. I'm going to pick out some of the details because Websites Closers is known for these long winded descriptions here. Video agent, video and animation agency, forefront of its niche, keep costs down with the corporate structure, quality service at a competitive price. The quality of work and eye for talent has enabled ownership to build an impressive creative network that it leverages regularly. These aren't, in, these aren't arbitrary freelancers. They're go-to creatives that have been working with the agency for more than seven years. Uh, barriers and competitive advantages are in place, making the company more enticing for a prospective buyer. It's difficult to break into the space. A big part of the revenue comes from past clients and referrals. Less than 3% of the revenue is used for advertising. Five core services offered, explainer videos, screencasts, mobile app demos, live action. 60% of the revenue is coming from explainer videos of a little over a minute. Project-based, $8,000 to $12,000 projects. Payment structure, not seeing anything too, in, uh, too crucial in that. Lead generation has been refined. They were running pay-per-click but no longer are. Since 2018, the leading marketing strategy has been targeted emails using Zoom info. Okay. Uh, that's odd. You usually don't hear about that, but I'm guessing that is cold outreach. And they're probably scraping their target customers using Zoom info. I'm not too familiar with the Zoom info. I know it's a way of getting contact info for key people at certain companies. But that's kind of my extent of the knowledge on it. And if they're saying email, I'd guess that they're cold emailing. All right, so... What do I think about this? First thing, 12 years in business, margins are good. Uh, that is really good. And that's certainly backing up their 4X multiple. Or more than 4X multiple. It's like a 4.1 or 2X multiple. Seven years in business, or set in a seven years in business, but seven years working with many of the same freelancers. So they're using the same freelancers. Uh, so it's an independent contractor model business. And... What else here? It seems like they're stressing quality, like they do very good quality work, which, you know, to get these margins and that revenue in this business is pretty good. Because if they're creating explainer and animated explainer videos, somebody could go on Fiverr and get that, right? At probably, not, not probably, but at definitely a much lower cost than $8,000 to $12,000. So they're spending this, they're working with corporate clients. I can tell that because they're using Zoom info. Uh, they're going for clients that have good bar good margins or good budgets to accommodate good margin projects and producing very high quality work. And it seems like they've carved out a very good niche. They're using independent contractors, which is nice because then you don't have, you know, so many people on payroll that you have to consistently pay. They're probably only paid or not probably, but I'm sure they're only paid on a per project basis. So if they're not, uh, if they're not selling any projects, they're not you know, they're not paying any payroll. Uh, I like this. It's been in business for 12 years. It's an independent contractor model business. The product, the product itself is digital. So it lives in the cloud, in the computer and their margins are good. I mean, this seems like a really nice business and that's why they're asking 4X for this business. Anything else in here? What don't I like about this business? I'm not sure what I don't like. The only thing I don't like here is the 4X. You know, now growing this business, it seems like there's room. Maybe there's room to grow it with paid advertisements. Maybe not. It's something I'll touch on here because I like paid advertising for businesses. But if they're targeting very high-end corporate clients, going directly to them with email marketing is, is a very effective and probably the most cost-effective strategy. You, you're not going to reach these clients with Facebook ads or Google ads where you're targeting the masses, right? With this email, they're very directly targeting the clients 
that they want. And at this point, probably the people they know will be good clients. So maybe you could market this with paid advertising, but it seems like they're going for a very targeted approach to their marketing. So, you know, another way of growing this might be through attending like trade shows and stuff like that, where your target customers are more at and you have their direct attention. But yeah, I like this business right here. The only thing I don't like is the multiple, but hey, you know, there's something called the value trap and that is when a business is cheap, there's a reason why. Well, when a business is higher priced, there's a reason why. At this value, I will say, and it doesn't say this thing is SBA pre-qualified and that might have something to do with the value. I don't know, but at this value and current interest rates, I will say that it will be hard or not hard, but after you, you know, consider your cost of debt servicing, you're going to be eating up a lot of your cash flow. You know, whereas two years ago, you could buy a business and the interest rate was like 6% less than it is now. And if the multiple was a 3x multiple, that was less than half your cash flow. With current interest rates on, you know, this business with the SBA, I'm guessing they're going to be probably 11 or 12% over a 10-year note. At this 4x multiple, your debt service costs are probably going to be close to 400 grand a year. So this thing is probably pushing the upper limits of what is financeable via SBA. I don't see anything about SBA mentioned in here. And usually they do list it. Usually website closers does list if it's SBA qualified in here. And that is not mentioned. Let's look at our next one here. The Safari booking business located in Puerto Rico. It's in Puerto Rico for a reason. I'll share that with you guys in a second after we go through this. Cash flowing $567,000, asking $850,000. So a very low, like 1.5x multiple on this. And that only makes me wonder, what is the value trap here? Gross revenue, 594, EBITDA, 567. This three-year-old business provides direct and indirect bookings for safaris to clients from its URL. Direct bookings are when a client wants a business to organize a safari, while indirect bookings are bookings where a client goes through the platform to book, but requests a particular service provider to handle their booking. The business collects the amount from the client and then pays providers to conduct the trips. Clients come many from referral and repeat bookings from past clients along with Google Ads. All right, so some grammar errors in that last sentence, but I think what they mean to say is many clients come from referral and repeat bookings in past clients along with some from Google Ads. Uh, the EBITDA having basically like 100% margin here, like 95%, tells me that there's not a lot of money spent on ads. So this business seems like some type of travel agency or lead generation agency for safaris, which I think is a very interesting niche. I don't know how exploited that niche is. I haven't heard anyone talking about it, so it might not be a very exploited niche. I have to wonder how much of a moat do they have around this business, right? Like, can anybody just start selling bookings or leads to safari providers? I don't know how big of a market that is out there. Uh, I also don't know what kind of liability comes with that. Like, <laughs> you know, what if you organize this booking and the safari goes to shit? I don't know. Or a cheetah attacks somebody that's walking around in Africa. I don't know what happens here. Just things to consider. And uh, this all kind of ties back to the multiple. Not, not so much that I'm worried about the liability because there's insurance. And there's ways that you can vet your safari providers, I'm sure. But how much of a moat do they have, right, for this low of a multiple? It was established in 2019, so it's been around three or four years, not the five that I'd like, but uh, it's got some staying power. I wonder how resilient the cash flow is. Maybe it was just not cash flowing, not cash flowing at all, and then it picked up some Google traffic or a Google update happened, and suddenly this year, you know, cash flow and revenue just spiked up, got a lot of traffic, and it may not be too stable. That's something that I would look for in this um, in this business model. Most li- yeah, most likely the Google traffic is where I'd be looking to see what's happening, right? How many of these are coming from referral and repeat bookings versus organic traffic? What is the source of these bookings and how sustainable is it? Ultimately to figure out why there's such a low multiple on the cash flow. And it doesn't seem like this is a, you know, a paid ads business. Um I do kind of like this. It seems seems very interesting. Safari booking seems, you know, like it's going to be a fairly resilient model. Of course, your one of the big downsides could be that the companies you're selling the leads to or 
in this case, booking through, you know, it's not exactly entirely clear how it's structured here, but they could front run you and get in front of you and get clients to book directly through them. That is one of the downsides to it. But from the details here, I think this is a pretty interesting business model. I would just want to know more about how sustainable this cash flow is and where it's actually coming from. If this business has, say, 25% of the cash flow coming from referral and repeat bookings, this could be a pretty good deal here. And oh, why is it located in Puerto Rico? Well, in Puerto Rico, there is the there's certain tax advantages to being located there, specifically for what are called service export businesses. And that means that you're in Puerto Rico producing the service and it is exported to people outside of Puerto Rico. And you have to spend 183 days a year on the island. I know about this because I looked at doing it and I went to Puerto Rico for a month. Ultimately, I decided it was not for me moving to Puerto Rico. was not for me and spending 183 days a year on the island. You have to be there performing your services for 183 days a year. Uh, and then you qualify for a 4% tax rate. So you're getting, you know, you're getting this $567,000 and only paying 4% tax. Huge, huge tax advantages. So a lot of online businesses that you know, fundamentally service export. You can provide, you can do your thing from Puerto Rico and your revenue comes from outside of Puerto Rico. A lot of businesses can, re, or a lot of businesses that qualify for that can relocate to Puerto Rico and save a ton of money. Logan Paul, I believe, did it, right? He's in the media business, earns his revenue, you know, globally. He relocated to Puerto Rico and he saves a ton of money on taxes by doing it. A substantial portion of my business income is would qualify for that, but ultimately I decided it was not for me. After um, you know, after going down there for a month, I like you know I like traveling around and mountain biking and all that. I didn't want to have to be worried about counting my days in Puerto Rico by the year. Next up, the e-commerce brand in the dental equipment industry, thirty percent net margins again by website closers, which means we're going to have a long description to pluck things out of. Cash flowing two hundred fifty-six thousand, asking nine hundred fifty thousand dollars. EBITDA 256. So this is the same as uh, you know, cash flow and EBITDA are the same, same on all three of them. And I don't know if this is a website closers thing or what. I feel like this is just a fluke. I feel like this never happens. They're usually close, but never the same like this. Cash flowing 256,000 on 728 grand. So healthy margins established in 2019. Again, not quite as long as I would like it. Almost a 4x multiple. Brand in the dental equipment industry, company provides customers with the necessary tools for work as a dentist. Uh, quality goods at competitive prices, top-notch margins. The current category is dental loops. I don't know what that is. And headlights, dental hand pieces, implant dentistry, intraoral cameras, endodontics, curing lights. So things that dentists use. There is significant potential to introduce new products and collections and promote them to existing customers by growing the email list. Opportunity, because the goods sold are essential for running a dental business. Okay, so they're kind of evergreen. Products, products are sourced by an agent in China directly from factories. The agent is a nice value add for a new acquirer because she negotiates better prices and terms where possible. She'll be helpful in finding new products. All products are sold under the brand name. They also come with a branded box. Some of the products have the logos engraved on them. That's nice. Uh, some Chinese New Year stuff. Only $2,000 worth of stock and inventory. Lucrative market, high profit margins. All right. So this is interesting. They're selling their own branded products to dentists. Not something I know much about, but I know that these products are often high margins and that as tools of the trade, dentists will typically pay for higher qualities. That has me wondering though, why are they not buying incumbent brands and why are they buying this? The other thing that I see about this as a potential downside is how are you going to market this, right? Like there's only so many dentists out there. Granted, there are quite a few of them, but this is not a broad market advertising type of product. Again, I have a lot of experience with broad market advertising. So, you know, it doesn't exactly tickle my pickle and light me up there. So to say, but that's not to say this isn't a bad business. I think it's a very good business. They've got healthy margins. The products are branded. That's what they have going for them. And they're carrying very low inventory established in 2019. I do like this business, but at a 4X multiple or nearly 4X, I like that video agency and animation studio a little bit more. 
Finally here, the 13-year-old natural lice remedy. FBA Ecom and Wholesale by Quiet Light. Income, $94,000. Revenue, $151,000. So good margins. Asking price, $340 plus inventory. So 3.62 multiple. Now, for a business of this size, I think this 3.62 multiple is rather steep. I will say that. This is a very little business at 151 k in revenue. Launched in 2009, this 13-year-old company sells natural lice prevention and treatment products. I'm just going to go through here and pick out some more details. Seller started the company after her daughter contracted lice at school and struggled to find effective treatment options. After conducting extensive research, she discovered and invested in a specialized comb that effectively removed the lice. Uh, discovered a natural formula to treat the lice by suffocating them. It's weird to see that word suffocating spelled out. As the need for treatment centers increased, the owner established a franchise and supplied her products to franchisees. In addition, she launched an online store and made her products available on Amazon. Pandemic had a negative impact. The owner is selling the business because she feels she has done everything to expand. So this is interesting because it's a natural lice product. And I think natural remedies are a ever-growing and an evergreen market. And lice treatment is going to be evergreen. As long as kids still go to school and the pandemic did not kill kids going to school, even after the pandemic, kids still go to school. Until kids stop going to school, and I don't see that ending, because school districts are still building schools, there will be lice. There will be a need to treat it. I think the value is a little high here for what they've got going on. They've got these franchisees, which we don't know about. We have these Amazon orders, and we got an online store. I'd love to know what the breakdown is between all of them. The franchisees on a business this small doing $151,000 in revenue just seem probably like they're not even worth it. Yeah, I just don't see it being worth it for anyone all the way around. And I don't even know what they mean by franchisees because this isn't like a franchise. <laughs> it's just a product. Uh, maybe I, I think a better term might be retailers for the product. Yeah, what I do like about it, though, again, is the market is evergreen. And if this was a business that was started as like somebody's side hustle, right, or somebody started by somebody that wasn't very familiar with online business, there could be a lot of room to grow this if you know if you really know how to market this product. So I think this is something that has a lot of growth potential. But I can say that at a 3.62 valuation, well, I, I would not be buying it. I would start my negotiation off much much, much, much lower than this, probably close to a 2.5, just because there's kind of like, you know, a little something here, but there's really nothing entirely proven. And I'm going to take a guess, considering this paragraph down here about the pandemic had a negative impact on the business, that revenue probably took a huge, huge, huge hit in 2020. And now it's just kind of came back enough to where they're like, all right, we can sell it. We can get something for it you know, and move on from here. Oh, and then they still want you to pay for inventory. Granted, inventory probably isn't much, but yeah, 3.62, not happening. It's an interesting business. I'd be shocked if anyone buys us at a 3.62 business. Now, if you get this business down to, you know, 250 with inventory or 200 even with inventory, then it looks attractive. But at this number, I would say it is rather high. On that note, guys, uh, we've taken up more time than I expected running through these four listings, so I'm not going to go on to listing number five, and I also have to go to the gym at 4.30, which means I need to leave my house in like two minutes, so I'm going to call it a wrap on that note. If you found this video helpful and insightful, you know the drill. Do me a sweet one. Hit the like button. Do yourself a sweet one. Hit the subscribe button so you get more of these experience-based insights, anecdotes, and expertise on these online businesses for sale every couple of weeks. I'm signing off.